Good day, everyone. Neophyte DAG bringing you another message. And in this message, it's part three of the timeline and etymology of the Bible. We're going to cover where the Bible now is moving out of Greece into the Roman Empire. This is a recap of where we left off. We talked about the Book of Thoth, that's the Bible, when it was in the hands of the Egyptians. We talked about the Septuagint when the Bible from the Egyptian made its way into Greece. Seventy books were taken out and formed the Septuagint. Now we're going to talk about where the Septuagint fell into the hands of the Romans. They kept it as the Septuagint for a while, then they changed it over into their own book. Also, from the summary, we're going to touch on where the Septuagint, there were Messiah characters created as part of the Septuagint. The character was called Serapis Christus. That's their Christ. And then the Christ color was also changed to a pale skin, fair skin character. They removed all the dark skin black people that were in the Book of Thoth and replaced them with pale skin, fair skin characters to match the color of the Greeks at that time when Egypt was conquered. Let's talk about now Greece and the Roman Empire, because as I mentioned before, when Romans conquered Greece, they, they just didn't throw out whatever the Greeks were doing. They took that on as their own until they built up themselves. So let's read the highlighted area. The Roman occupation of the, of the Greek world was established after the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. So we established that the Roman Empire took over the Greek Empire 31 BC, which matched with the timeline I presented earlier. And as part of that conquest, they continued the Greek culture and language. The Byzantine Empire, that's a Roman Empire, that's what it was called at that time, they generally followed the Greek culture and language. So they spoke the same language, they had the same culture. So they continued the Septuagint after the conquest of Greece. The Greek culture and custom was carried on by the Roman Empire until around 325 AD. That's when the Roman Empire said, now we need to form our own culture around the Bible that we inherited from the Greeks. They're going to take the Septuagint, change it over to fit now the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was at its pinnacle at this point, so it needed its own religious identification, and this is what's going to happen. In 325 AD, the first Council of Nicaea was formed, and what was it? It was a council of all the Roman priests that were brought together to make decisions around what the religious order of the Roman Empire should be. And what they were arguing at that point in time was how to establish a firm religious foundation that met the demand of the Roman Emperor and the Roman Catholic Church. So they had all the Roman Catholic priests, bishops, gathered together to make decisions. Two main decisions they formed that I want to bring to your attention. The first one is, let's read in red, the Christological issue of the divine nature of God the Son and his relationship to God the Father. What does that mean? They were trying to figure out what to do with the renewed Serapis Christus character if he should be Father, Son, and Holy Ghost which we now inherit in our time. So they took the Serapis Christus character, they're going to form their own character out of it, their own Messiah, their own Savior, and they wanted to decide to make the Savior the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Another thing that they were trying to decide on was what to do with their observation of Easter. They were competing with the Passover, which was the Egyptian culture handed down to the Greeks. The Greeks maintained the Passover. Now the Romans wanted to know 
what they should do with the Passover and how it should relate to the new holiday they want to form around the Son, the Son which they created as their Messiah, Jesus. They had created a, an ideology around the Son, Jesus, and they wanted to form a day specific to that character. That was the Easter observance. Now, not everyone was in agreement with, with what the Roman Catholic Church was doing. And they're called the Arians. The Arians are the folks who said, no, we believe that there's only one God, that God is the supreme God, and there is no other God. And the Son, which is the descendant of the God, cannot be the God himself, the God Almighty. The Son is only the Son, and the God Almighty is the God Almighty which goes against the new doctrine that the Roman Catholic Church was trying to put forward, where the Son is the Father and also the Son and is the Holy Ghost. So the Arian said, listen, we don't agree. So a dispute arose between the Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and the Arian nations that were part of the Roman Catholic Church but did not agree. So the dispute issue centered on the nature and the relationship of God, the Father, and the Son of God, which is Jesus. So the church wanted to make Jesus the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, the heir, and they're saying, no, God is God, and the Son is the Son. There's two separate beings, two separate spiritual entities, and we're not going to agree that you should put them as one. And the controversy began. So one of the biggest controversial figure at the time, his name was Arius, which formed the word Arian. He said, there's a supremacy and the uniqueness of God the Father, meaning the Father alone is almighty and infinite. And therefore the Father divinity must be greater than the Son. And the Roman Catholic Church, the bishops are saying, no, the Son is as great as the Father, and he's actually the Father. So we're going to form our own establishment based on that. And the Arians did not agree. Hence, the Council of Nicaea was formed. What else did the Arians argue? They argued the supremacy of God the Father, and they maintained that the Son as an act of the Father's will. That means Father formed the Son and said, go do these things on my behalf. So the Son was made by the Father and begotten directly by the Eternal Father. That's what the Arians were putting forward. And the Arians, again, appealed to the scriptures, quoting biblical statements such as, the Father is greater than I, and that the Son is firstborn of all creation. So they were saying the Son was created by the Father, not the Son is the Father. The Father created himself as a Son, which is what the Roman Catholic Church was putting forward, and which is what they succeeded to put forward, and it's lasting until our time now. So there was a controversy. It didn't go down very well, where people are gladly accepting it. We'll find out what happened later on. So what we're going to see from this now is the argument made by the church against the Arians. They're saying the church, the Roman Catholic Church, the father was always a father and both a father and a son existed always together eternally and co-equally and co-substantially. That means the father and the son are the same. And the Arians are saying, no, there's God Almighty, and then there's a Son. And those in opposition to Arius believe that to follow Arian view destroyed the unity of God and made the Son unequal to the Father. So there's a big, there was a huge controversy going on, and the church made its argument, the Arians made its argument, that the Son had no beginning but at an eternal derivation, from the Father, and therefore co-eternal with the Father. So the, the church put forward more arguments, saying the Son had no beginning and no end, so he's equal to the Father, and they pushed that forward as well. 
Now let's jump to what happened after the arguments were put forward by the Arians and by the church. The council made its declaration that the son was the true God. So Jesus was the true God. And they said, this is what we're going to go with. This is the position that we're going to take. And everybody who refused to endorse that creed, whatever doctrine that the church decided on, was exiled, meaning you were kicked out of the nation, stripped of all your belongings, all your property, and any book, booklets, pamphlets, or any literature that you worked on that goes against what the church had decided on were confiscated and burned. At that time, this is how anyone who presented arguments that went against the church was dealt with. So in addition of being excommunicated, the works of Arius, the, the original Arian, were ordered to be confiscated, locked up, and whatever they decided on, they would also burn those books, information, doctrine that were put forward by Arius. So that was the outcome of the Nicaea Council. Jesus, the newly created Jesus, being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Anything that did not coincide with that, after that debate of the Council of Nicaea was done, they burned everything. And whoever did not agree, all the Arians were excommunicated, meaning you were either killed, locked up, chased out of town, but you did not have the freedom now to express your ideas. It was the church's idea or else. Now, this is the Jesus that was created as part of the Nicaea Council. Remember, the Jesus character did not exist during the time of the Roman taking over the Septuagint and the Roman existing with the Septuagint from 30 BC to 325 AD. That's when they formed the Council of Nicaea to decide on the Jesus character. So let's read where Jesus came from. This is Jesus now, the origination of Jesus. Started around 4 BC to 30 AD. So it coincided with the time that the Romans conquered Greece. They conquered Greece in 30 BC. So from 30 BC to 4 BC, there was no Jesus. They created it in 4 BC. So they got the Serapis Christus character, transformed it over to Jesus. And we're going to find that out. I'm just, I'm going to give you the chronology of it as well. So let's read this now. Jesus, he's the central figure in Christianity. We all know that. We are living with that figure right now. Christian belief is the incarnation of God the Son and the awaited Messiah, the Christ, prophesies in the Old Testament. That's not true, but this is what the Christian believe. So at least they put it, they believe that. What I want to point out to you is the time when Jesus came about. 4 BC, I want you to follow the timeline. Who hold the Bible at 4 BC? That's the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire between 283 BC to 30 BC did not have the Jesus character. They had Serapis Christus. The Roman Empire took over the Greek Empire in 30 BC and they formed in 4 BC the Jesus character. Original name for Jesus. So there was no Jesus name. There was no J, but we'll get to that in a minute. Let's look at this to see where the, where the Jesus came from. The English name Jesus, it's an English name. Roman was using Latin at the time. The English name Jesus derived from the late Latin name Lusos, which transiterates the Greek name Loisos. So Greek, it was Loisos, Latin, it became Lesos, 
In English, it became Jesus. When did English come about? English is further down in our timeline. We're not even in the English time as yet. We're still, right now we're in Latin. Because remember, it was taken from Greek, Loisos. When the Romans took it over, it became Losos. So let's pause right there before we get to our English, because we're in English time, and we thought everything was in English from the beginning of time. No, nope. they spoke Latin all the way up until in the uh, 1600, when they decided now we're going to make some transformation to English as the main language. In the Septuagint and other Greek language, where the Jewish, Jewish text is, they use loisos. That's the name that they also used to form Yeshua. Loisos was used at time, then they transformed the name to Yeshua, and which represent the name Joshua. They call it Joshua, and they call it Loisos. And those were named given to the Serapis Christus character. That's the chronology of it. Loisius changed to Lustus in the Roman language, in Latin. Loisius, they also use other Hebrew names, Yeshua, and Yeshua is Joshua. I want you to make note of that. That's why I'm repeating it. But the name is Loisius in Greek. In Latin, is Lusus. In our Bible, in modern day Bible, it's now J, where the L was made several transformation. It transformed itself into I, and then it transformed into a J to form the J letter, but there was no J letter. So let's look at the Latin letter and make the right name for the character that they were placing as Serapis Christus, Losus, now to our modern day Jesus. When you use L, a lowercase L, to spell Losus, you get Joshua. If you go and do your Google Translate, and I encourage you to do it, that's why I put it here. Lowercase l-e-s-u-s form the word Joshua from Latin to English. That's why I wanted to give you that meaning, that the L was transformed to a J. When you use the uppercase L for losus, you get the word wounded. But we want the word Joshua because as it told us before, let me scroll back to it. Losus is used to represent the name Joshua. So in the Latin transformation, you're going to get Joshua as well. So going back here, when we spell Losus with a lowercase l, E-S-U-S, we get Joshua, just as it says we should get. Try it out for yourself. Use your Google Translate. So we know that the losus is an L that's spelling it, L-E-S-U-S, -S, a lowercase l, to get the right trans, you know, transformation to Joshua. The reason why I'm spending that much time on it is because now I'm going to take you to the letter J. The letter J, that's where it was created in the 1500s, 1524, I believe, yes by a Roman person, a Roman priest, called Gian Tricino. He created the J. And he's saying the I and the J are representing two different sounds. So whatever was in an I, he's transforming it to a J. Whatever we're using now as an I, Back then, he's saying it has a J sound, but we know distinctly now that I and J have different sounds in English. The letter J was created in 1524. That's what I want you to pull from this. So now when we get our modern day Jesus, 
that Jesus sound did not exist up until 1524 when they created the J. It was losos, lesos. That's what was the sounding of it. And why that is important when we get back to the name Lewis, we're going to realize that's the code name for Jesus because the L was changed to J. And if you move it back to its original L, you will get more understanding as to why the code name is Lewis. But we'll continue. But I want you to know that J was created by a Roman priest, Gian Gersino, in 1524. Let's test what they're saying, that the I is the transformation of Asos to Jesus. Because that's what modern day you're being told, that it was really an I, and we transform the I into a J to get Jesus. Let's do Isos. When you do Isis in the Latin translation, you get I-E pig. And that's a lowercase I. If you use an uppercase I, which they're saying it is an uppercase I, you get I-E pig in English. So if I'm taking these two Latin transformation, transforming them to English, I am not getting Joshua. I'm getting pig. So it's clearly showing that L. E-S-U-S -S is the original Latin word to get you Joshua. That's what is being pulled out of this. The Latin word is really L-E-S-U-S. -S. What I want you to get from this is that the Latin translation from losus to English is an L sound, not an I sound. That's the one that we covered here that got you back to Joshua. A lowercase l gets you Joshua, which corresponds with the information that we're getting here, that locious represent the name Joshua. That's what I want you to pull from this, that it's an L word with an L sound. which brings us to the Bible, our modern day Bible. But I'm taking you back to the original Bible that we used, which was formed in 1611, the King James original Bible. That is the, one of the first fundamental English translation of the Bible that we have now in circulation. The Roman Catholic have their own English version and King James, who was the king of England, Ireland, Scotland, and the Wales at that time wanted to have his own Bible. He did not have any respect, trust, or reverence for the Roman Catholic and their religion, and he wanted to create his own Bible for his people, which covers the truth as he sees it, which is outside of what the Roman Catholic Church was telling its congregation. So what he did, he knew the Roman Catholic were about to form a Christian Bible to disseminate among the English-speaking population, and he wanted his people to have his version of the English Bible. So he created the 1611 King James Bible. What I want you to see in this is the original way the Bible was written. And let's read it together and set up, V is a U in Old English, over, U is also a V, set up over his head is accusation written. This is lessus, but in our modern day, we put an I, but as we establish from the Latin translation, because now what they're doing here, they're using the Latin word for Jesus, which is lessus with the I, but we know it's an L, lessus. 
the king of the lose. So they put again another I, but it's an L, lose, because we established that wherever they're talking about Jesus with the J and Jews with the J, it's really an L should be there because the, those were the Latin words. So we, the L has to remain there. So it's less sus and Lewis. <laughs> that's the way the code name, <laughs> that's where the code name comes in as Jesus is a code name for Lewis Jew is a code name for Lewis. Same character that's being talked about. That's why I took you through that long explanation so I can get you ready for these code names that are given to you. But if you don't know where the code is coming from, it will miss you. And you'll think it's Jesus, the character that they want you to understand, and Jew, the persons, the Caucasian persons that you now see as the Jews, no, it's not. It's code word for the true character leading you back into Egypt, the Lewis character. Lusus, code name for Lewis. Jews, code name for Lewis. This is in the 1611 King James Bible. Look it up yourself. But that's what I want you to pull from this. Let's do a comparison of the Greek Serapis Christus and the Jesus image that was created in 300 AD. That's the time where the Nicaea Council wanted to pull together an image that would still keep the Greek feature, but now an image that they can call their own Roman Catholic image. They wanted to move away entirely from the Greek culture and custom, form their own. A side-by-side -side comparison, you'll see how identically related and resemblance they have. All they did, they took the character from the Greek, made it into their own. They didn't change much about it. They kept the character the same. And this was the Jesus character that was being put forward, the one on the right-hand side, in 300 AD to go with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that decision that was made by the Nicaea Council, and as well as now to change the name to Lossus, the Latin name. This is where your Jesus character originated from. Also, you can see that he's a white skin, Caucasian skin, Caucasian feature character, same as the image that was created by the Greeks, a Caucasian, a white feature character. The second issue that was faced by the Nicaea Council is what to do with the Jewish Passover. The Greeks had kept the Passover in place. The Roman Catholics say they want to have their own Passover time, which is different, separated from what the Jewish people were doing. The Jewish people were part of the Aryan dispute that was going on, and they wanted to separate themselves now from the Aryans and form their own Roman Catholic significant day that they're going to dedicate to this new Jesus character. That's now the formation of Easter. The feast of the Easter, they wanted to link to the Jewish Passover, the feast of the unleavened bread but they wanted now to pull it in on different time period. Let's read on. So the early Pope, Pope Sixtus, he decided to set Easter to a Sunday in the lunar month Nissan. Lunar month Nissan, for those who have gone through my Passover message, that's a month which starts first day of the moon in the month of March, and it goes all the way until about middle of April. Nissan is between March and April in our modern day time. So that's when Pope Sixtus wanted to start their Easter in the month of Nissan. 
to determine which lunar month was designated as the month of Nisan, the Christians relied on the Jewish community, not the Ashkenazi Jews that you have now, but the original Jews during the Egyptian era that were still remaining in the Greek control that was now passed over into the Roman Catholic control. So they consulted with them, those original ancient Egyptians that still had the knowledge of the lunar month, Nisan, and the Passover. So the Romans were consulting them at that time. They relied on the Jewish community to get their information. But the Christians now, they argued they should abandon that practice. They should not rely on the customs of the Jews anymore, the Lewis anymore. So they said, we're not going to rely on Jewish informants, the Lewis informant. We're going to form our own Roman Catholic customs. This is what this information is passing on to you. What did they do after that? There are some of their scholars around that time as well. Anatolius, he argued that Easter ought to be celebrated on the same day as the Jewish Passover, the Lewis Passover, the 14th of the Jewish month, Nisan. And that's the lunar month, meaning that's the moon month, Nisan. So in the month of Nisan, that's based on the Egyptian moon calendar, where they track the moon from its darkness to its full brightness, back to the darkness again. That's the lunar calendar. And you'll also have the solar calendar for the Egyptian, which track the sun. But we'll stick to the lunar calendar, Nisan. That's what his recommendation was, that the Easter holiday should be tied to the Egyptian Passover, the Jewish, the Lewis Passover in the month of Nisan, the 14th day of that month. And this is more information on the lunar month. This is the Egyptian lunar month calendar, Nisan, which is also called the Abib, which is also called the Aviv. In the month of Nisan, that's when the Passover holiday is maintained by the Lewis, also known the Jewish people. Watch the importance of that. In the book of Exodus 13, verse 3, it talks about that Passover day. And Moses said unto the people, remember the Passover day, because of the day you were in bondage, and you were brought out of that bondage by the Lord, Thoth, and brought into a safe place. So that is the Passover itself. It's a celebration of being brought out of bondage that the children of Israel, the children of Lewis, the Lewis people, the Jewish people were put into. Now they were being brought out of it by the Lord. And that day, the Passover was established as a day of celebration of that event. That occurred in the past, and they kept celebrating it time and time over throughout all their generation. Now let us read from Exodus 13, verse 4. This day came he out in the month of Abib. And if we go back here, where we see the month of Nisan, right here, it's also called Abib. So it's the same month that's being talked about, Abib and Nisan are the same month. So going back here, where it says, this day ye came out is in the month of Bib, is in the month of Nisan, the 14th day of the month Nisan. That's the celebration day of the Passover, the Jewish Passover. And during that time, seven days shall thou eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day of those seven days shall be the feast of the Lord, the feast of Thoth. They make a feast to the Lord. So that's the instruction that's given. It was left in the original Bible that we inherit right now, but we just lost the meaning and the identity of it because 
as people of color, black people, dark skinned people, we don't think these days are related to us because there's another group of Caucasian people who have taken over the identity of the Lewis, the Jewish, and taken it for themselves. And we are of the mindset, the days are talking about their celebration. No, it's not. It's talking about the Egyptian people, people of dark skin complexion that were scattered about the entire globe. Most of them now are in North America, the Caribbean, Central America and South America, but a large body of them are in North America. It's talking about you, black people, dark skin people, melanated people that are in North America, the Caribbean, Central America, South America. This is your day, the Passover. You are being brought out of Egypt, the hands of the Egyptians. Egypt is America. Wherever you see Egypt in the Bible, it means America. And you're now being brought to a safe place. The safe place in America is North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. Those are the designated safe places in America where you're going to have all that wonderful thing coming to you. But this is a history repeating itself because this also had happened in the past time and it's going to happen again in our time. In our modern day time, the Passover begins on March 27th, 2021 in our current time and it ended April 3rd, 2021. This message might be reaching you after that time has passed, but I've had other messages that talks about the Passover, which was sent out before the Passover to alert us, people of color, that this day belonged to us. This celebration belonged to us. The seven to eight days belonged to us. Now, the children of Lewis, the Jewish Lewis people, Passover was replaced with Easter. And where am I getting this from? This is simple research you can do. You can pull it up on Wikipedia. You can go into other scholarly books in uh, archive.org. It will get you the same place. As part of the resolution reached by the Nicaea Council during that meeting where they decided Jesus was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and they decided on Easter, they decided Easter should be a separate day and time from the Passover. And this is the decree that was passed after that. All the brethren in the East who have hitherto, meaning who have always followed the Jewish practice, will henceforth, will from this time on, observe the Roman customs. And that's what it's saying. And of yourself and all of us, who from ancient time have kept Easter together with you. So no more following the Jewish practice of Passover. We're going to split from what those dark-skinned black people were doing, and we're going to now follow the Roman Catholic Easter. So the Easter you celebrate is not your day. It came up recently, 300 A.D., and that move forward, it's not an ancient day and time. The Passover by the dark-skinned people in Egypt has been around for thousands, thousands of years before the Easter showed up. So that's what I want to pass to you is that we're now celebrating days which are not our days. Those days were forced upon us by the First Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And since that time, we've been running with those days as our own days, but they're not. And if you don't research the history, the timeline, the chronology of what's being given to you, then we'll think it's something natural to us when it's not. I will pause at this point, you know, in this message and there's more to come on this, but I'll pause at this point and we'll pick it up next time where we continue to talk about all the rest of the things that were part of the transformation of the Bible from the Greek Septuagint 
to the Roman Catholic Bible and the transformation of the Greek Serapis Christus to the Roman Catholic Jesus Christ.